Welcome, everyone. A very warm welcome to the very large audience we know we have online as well. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm director of Chatham House, and it's great to have you all here. And it is particularly good to have His Excellency. Sorry, more people coming in. Welcome. Uh, Musalia Mudavadi, who has two substantial jobs we were discussing before, either of which would keep many people awake, but are doing them uh, both together is quite formidable. He's Prime Cabinet Secretary and Cabinet Secretary for Foreign and Diaspora Affairs of Kenya. And we're going to talk about all kinds of things. He's first going to talk to us for 15, 20 minutes about Kenya's foreign policy challenges. It has been a really exceptional year um, of many initiatives on many, many fronts, which our team has been uh, covering very energetically with relations with China, with the Middle East, and many, um, many, many, many uh, um, ties that Kenya has very adroitly managed to develop and strengthen. And we spend quite a bit of time discussing it in the context of British foreign policy about how a country can uh, keep many and develop many foreign relationships very, uh, in a very flourishing way. So I think we're going to hear about this. I have lots of questions I might ask from everything from trade to China, um, but I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. I'm going to leave very good time for them. Please do um, send questions online as well, and please do um, tweet or post, as we must now call it. Um, this is, I should say, in, unless, in case it is not completely obvious, it is on the record. And if you want to tweet or post at CH events or at Chatham House, um, that will uh, enable everyone to follow it. So with that, the warmest of welcomes to Chatham House, Your Excellency. Thanks. You can stand up or sit, sit down as you like. I think I would rather stand up. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you have something for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Um, now, I was asking uh, the chair, how do I pronounce your name a few minutes earlier? And she told me, so I'll try and make it right. Bronwyn, Madame Bronwyn, thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for sparing some time so that we can have an opportunity to engage uh, and discuss a number of issues, not just about Kenya, but perhaps uh, Africa uh, and uh, some aspects of the globe as we see it from Kenya. Um, when I got the invitation, um, the guideline I was given was to try and look at uh, Kenya's strategic approach to peace, uh, economic connectivity, and aspects of sustainable development uh, within the current context. Um, so I'll try and make some very few remarks uh, and then look forward to some engagement with yourselves. And I believe uh, we'll have an opportunity to learn from each other uh, in this process. Um, so here goes. Uh, Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be at Chatham House, a global beacon of thought leadership. I am here to help probe into the workings of Kenya's foreign policy imperatives. My visit also comes on the heels of a memorable tour of Kenya by His Majesty King Charles III. I am here to extend our heartfelt gratitude for His Majesty's enriching visit to Kenya. May I also take this opportunity to congratulate my counterpart my new counterpart here, Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs of the United Kingdom, Lord David Cameron, and his immediate predecessor, and now the new Home Secretary, James Spencer Cleverly. 
The two are consummate diplomats who have steered the Kenya-UK relations to an even keel. In an August 2023 review, the United Kingdom exported 21.7 million pounds of goods services to Kenya and imported 29.8 million pounds worth of goods from Kenya, resulting in a negative trade balance of 8.15 million pounds in favor of Kenya. I highlight this to illustrate a rare occurrence where the balance of trade favors an African country. Our foreign policy imperative is to facilitate Kenya's transformation into a competitive export-led economy, enhance regional integration, and widen participation in both domestic and international trade. Under the guiding bottom-up economic transformation agenda, the payoff is beginning to show. Kenya's trade balance recorded a deficit of 847.6 million US dollars in September 2023, compared with a deficit of $1 billion in the previous month of August. Kenya supports regional economic integration through the African Continental Free Trade Area. At full implementation, this will create the largest free trade area in the world. It will connect 1.3 billion people across 55 countries with a combined gross domestic product valued at 3.4 trillion US dollars and with a potential to lift it, to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty. Our commitment to the Africa Free Continental Trade is in, embroidered in a visa-free entry policy for all Africans. It is in this spirit of continental unity that His Excellency President William Ruto proposed a visa-free Africa, tearing down barriers imposed by hands that were not African. We reject the limitations of the past, advocating for a continent where Africans trade, communicate, and explore freely. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency President Ruto's diplomatic efforts have yielded significant achievements and benefits for Kenya's economic development. Our administration is embarking upon a new age of diplomacy where friendships and relationships are interwoven with mutually beneficial economic engagements. The King's visit to Kenya in October crowned a deluge of no less than 25 visiting world heads of state and governments in less than a year, not to mention those who attended the inaugural Africa Climate Summit in September. The visits point to the growing stature of Kenya as a dependable investment destination and more so as an honest peace broker in the eastern rim of Africa. Again, this is by design. Our forays in the sphere of economic diplomacy have yielded positive results. For example, in November, the government of India granted approval for the establishment of the India Exim Bank East Africa representative office in Nairobi, marking a significant stride in economic diplomacy. This decision comes on the heels of India Exim's Bank's substantial financing package for Kenya in diverse sectors, including energy, textile, apparel, agriculture, and support for small and medium-scale enterprises. This move not only reflects confidence in Kenya as a premier investment destination, but also underscores Nairobi's pivotal role as a regional financial hub. At the heart of Kenya's foreign policy lies a steadfast backbone of commitment to peace and security. Our nation, nestled strategically in East Africa, Africa, not only safeguards tranquility within its borders, 
but also actively contributes to regional and global stability. As we canvass for favorable terms of trade and investment, President William Ruto has almost single-handedly led the charge for peace and security in East Africa region, which has been grappling with formidable challenges related to security and peace. Kenya took the lead in the African Union, Somalia conflict resolution, and the recent incorporation of Somalia into the East African community. President Ruto took a frontline position in the Democratic Republic of Congo, sending peacekeeping troops to Eastern DRC and the East African Regional, under the East African Regional Force. Meanwhile, His Excellency the President is busy in seeking resolution of the Sudan conflict. Kenya's mediation in the Ethiopia Eritrea conflict has resulted in a cessation of hostilities and facilitated, uh, facilitated Eritrea's re-entry into the Regional Intergovernmental Authority on Development, commonly known as IGAD. We are seeking a peace dividend with our diplomacy of conflict resolution so as to strategically position ours as a peace and investment ready IGAD region that stretches over an area of 5.2 million square kilometers, and it comprises Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and Uganda, with about 6,960 kilometers of coastline along the Indian Ocean, Gulf of Aden, Gulf of Tordura, and the Red Sea, and is a market of 300 million people. Additionally, Kenya still wears its traditional laurels in numerous UN peacekeeping missions. At the behest of the UN Security Council, our police units are preparing to be deployed to Haiti, not to impose governance, but to preserve peace and create an environment for democracy to flourish in a unique Haitian context. Kenya has dutifully embraced a role as a peacekeeper, mediator, and active participant globally and within the United Nations framework, underscoring a commitment to global harmony. Friends, the world is interconnected culturally, socioeconomically, and politically, and the new kid on the block that is the environment. In fact, the reality of our connectivity, courtesy of climate change, has become more poignant. Kenya is acutely aware of the existential threat posed by climate change, particularly to developing nations like ours. Our foreign policy advocates for a global response to this crisis it emphasizes the need for developed nations to take the lead in reducing emissions and supporting developing nations in their adaptation efforts. This is the essence of President William Ruto's call for the review of the financial architecture of green investments and carbon credit tax in favor of those who produce less emissions at the COP 28. Meanwhile, Kenya is at the forefront of sustainable development and climate action. Our commitment to these issues is evident. Kenya hosted the first ever Africa Climate Summit, which yielded an Africa position on climate change. The President now chairs the Committee of African Heads of State and government on climate change. During the recent Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, President Ruto, alongside other African heads of state, affirmed Africa's ded ded dedication to being integral to the solution for climate change. President Ruto emphasized the inseparable link between climate change and Africa's development 
rallying African leaders to collaborate with developed nations and hold them accountable for climate action commitments. This collective commitment mirrors Kenya's proactive stance on the global climate change agenda. As part of its contribution to global climate initiative, Kenya has proposed the establishment of a global climate financing charter by 2025, outlined in the Nairobi Declaration. This charter is envisioned as a pivotal tool for securing funding for sustainable climate endeavors. Kenya advocates for equitable credit practices, including extending debt repayment timelines for nations facing physical challenges. Kenya's perspective on climate change encompasses global collaboration, local green growth initiatives, financial reforms, and a strong emphasis on equity and fairness. These measures underscore the nation's steadfast commitment to addressing climate change, safeguarding the environment, and promoting shared prosperity. In this respect, Kenya has a comprehensive National Climate Change Action Plan for the 2023 to 2027 period. It outlines our transitioning to a low carbon and climate resilient development pathway through improving water management, green energy, and fostering sustainable economic growth. Kenya's Forest Conservation and Management Act of 2016 provides a framework for the sustainable management of forest resources. The law underscores the critical role forests play in mitigating climate change and preserving biodiversity. This is why Kenya has embarked on planting 15 billion trees by 2032. My friends, you'll be amazed on how planting trees has become a natural pastime for Kenyans today. Birthday gifts are tree seedlings, and government and social functions are not complete without a tree planting ceremony. A new national culture is emerging in favor of a clean environment. Indeed, even when His Majesty was in Kenya, he had to participate, and I witnessed him planting a tree in Karura Forest. These highlights demonstrate Kenya's active role in tackling climate change and promoting sustainable development, and reflects the country's dedication to national and international commitments aimed at preserving our planet for future generations. Let me now turn to the role of the Kenyan diaspora. Their role cannot be overstated. They serve as our foremost ambassadors and hold a major stake as investors in our nation. The diaspora makes significant contributions to our economy, remitting billions of dollars annually. The diaspora serves as cultural ambassadors, fostering understanding and cooperation between Kenya and their host countries. Likewise, our foreign policy aims to support and protect the diaspora, recognizing their crucial role in our national development. The Kenyan diaspora, particularly in the United Kingdom, has been instrumental in bridging the gap between our two nations. In 2020, the diaspora in the UK remitted an equivalent of 230 million US dollars or close to 180 million pounds sterling. The inflows have increased tenfold in the last 15 years, reaching an all-time tidy sum of 3.7 billion US dollars, or equivalent to about 3 billion pounds sterling in 2021. The transfers fuel the Kenyan economy, supporting families, funding education, and stimulating local business. However, it is worth repeating that the diaspora also fosters understanding and cooperation between the two nations as they contribute to the diversity 
and multicultural fabric of the UK, sharing Kenyan traditions, food, music, hospitality, and values. Kenya, from our perspective, transcends mere geographical boundaries. It is not merely a piece of land straddling, straddling the equator, but a vibrant community of people. We aspire for global recognition, not solely based on our excep ex exceptional athletes, but as a nation characterized by astute professionals, passionate Democrats, and diligent global citizens. Kenya's ident identity extends beyond physical borders, encompassing the richness of its people and the contributions to the global community, including the United Kingdom. Prominent figures of Kenyan descent have made their mark in the United Kingdom, investing in real estate and other sectors. I will not talk about the political side of it. In the realm of sports, Victor Wanyama, a professional footballer, made a significant contribution to the UK football scene and has helped promote Kenya as a producer of world-class sporting talent. Similarly, cultural diplomacy is a key component of our foreign policy as it fosters understanding, cooperation, and mutual respect between nations. Kenyan-born artist Michael Armitage has gained international fame exploring social issues in East Africa. His exhibitions in the UK have enriched this country, country's art scene with awareness of issues affecting Kenya and the wider Africa region. Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, as Kenya approaches the momentous occasion of celebrating 60 years of independence, we share at the intersection of a rich history marked by both triumphs and challenges. We stand as a shining beacon on the African continent. Our unwavering commitment to democratic principles has not only endured the test of time, but has manifested in the successful transition of power through democratic processes over several decades. This commitment, deeply rooted in the sacrifices of our valiant forefathers who fought for independence remains a source of national pride. Looking forward, the core of our vision is a resolute focus on economic transformation through the grassroots upward. Beyond the formulation of policies, we are cultivating a legacy of limitless growth and shared prosperity under the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. In driving this vision, our foreign policy is holistic, grounded in our commitment to peace, economic cooperation, cultural diplom diplomacy, and sustainable development. We remain steadfast in our commitment to these principles, confident that they will guide us towards a more peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. I look forward to a world where peace, economic connectivity, and sustainable development are not just aspirational goals, but tangible realities. Let us therefore strive to weave a tapestry that celebrates our collective strength and diversity, a world where every thread contributes to a more vibrant, resilient, and interconnected global community. Asanteni sana, thank you for listening. Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed. You've taken us everywhere from trade and investment to um, the wider diplomacy of, of Kenya. And it, as you said, a very, very active year for that. New trade deal with the EU, the German Chancellor in Nairobi, uh, Russian Foreign Minister, King Charles, um, and, and negotiations with the US over a new trade pact, and President Ruto visiting Beijing, many, many sided. And I'm really struck by some of the phrases you've used in this, a new age of diplomacy, of Kenya being an honest peace broker by design. 
Um, and I, I, and you say, can you say, embrace the role as a peacekeeper. I wondered if you could take us just a bit more into what the goals are of Kenya's foreign policy in that, in that respect. You've been very, very emphatic about Kenya's role in trying to help solve conflicts of which the world has many. Yes, uh, and I'll focus uh, primarily, particularly in the region where we, we are now. Um, you will notice that uh, there's a sudden upheaval. Um, we have the problem in Sudan. Uh, we have the South Sudan that is also facing its challenges. Uh, um, Somalia is just uh, carefully beginning to come on board from uh, 30 years of, of, uh, of challenges. Um, we also see the potential of uh, the emerging undemocratic practices in uh, the West African side uh, of the continent. And so many other challenges, um, even within uh, uh, the Ethiopia uh, issues that are coming up. And, and we look at this as something that we need to focus on because uh, the amount of uh, disorder that is going to be generated if there isn't proper attention could cause a lot of havoc and misery for millions of people. In Sudan alone, uh, we are talking now of uh, about 1.2 million people who have actually sought refuge in different parts of the country, um, and uh, maybe almost six million internally displaced uh, because of that conflict. And if we are not careful, we will start getting pressures for dismembering uh, these sovereign states by different groups and so forth, as an example. Um, so the world has several conflicts. You have the Ukraine. Russia conflict, and then you have the Middle East conflict. <coughs> and all of a sudden, if we are not careful, the challenges facing Africa will recede into the back burner. And therefore, as Kenya, uh, we believe it's our role um, to actively participate in uh, trying to mediate uh, and uh, bring stability uh, in, in, in that particular region. So we will have no option but to be more aggressive uh, in these efforts. In fact, as I speak, I think uh, today is the 7th. On the 9th, uh, the president of Kenya will be in Djibouti uh, under the IGAD initiative uh, to try and uh, talk to the Sudan issue uh, once again because it's becoming uh, quite serious. Uh, the gender process uh, seems to be stalling, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, the, the African nations will have to play a more important role with the backing uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the other countries. We say so because ultimately uh, these solutions must be homegrown. Uh, when I say homegrown, African solutions. Uh, and, and Kenya uh, stands tall at this point in time to try and become a pivotal force in uh, helping out. So we cannot be silent bystanders. Yeah. So I was interested, you used the phrase peace dividend mm -hmm. and said, look, we're investing in security, we're spending a lot more time on this. Uh, if I understood you rightly, you're saying, but we can take a peace dividend. Well, and. Um, that actually the benefits of this, if you like, time and effort spent on security were coming through. Did, did I understand you rightly in this? Because the world seems very unpeaceful at the moment. It does, and uh, efforts must be concerted. Um, in my remarks, I talk of uh, a market hmm. place of about 300 million people, just around the IGAD framework. Uh, if you talk about the African uh, continent, you're talking of 1.4 million. Now, with these disruptions, um, we are not going to see the benefits of, 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 of that market. So the, the, the peace dividend is literally uh, the pillar 
uh, to unlocking the potential that is there. Yeah. Well, the UK and European countries felt they could take a peace dividend after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, but it doesn't feel quite like that yeah. at the moment. Well, uh, they thought they could take it, but of course now things have changed. Yes. But uh, that does not mean that we should not pursue mm. uh, the objectives. Mm. Um, uh, Africa uh, is the sleeping giant. Um, and for too long, we continue uh, relapsing um, into some of the, the awkward circumstances like now. So, so there's, there's need for uh, the international community, the world, to, to remember that uh, as much as we have challenges elsewhere, um, we want to help the African people. We can't afford uh, the cost of uh, the humanitarian crisis mm. that is beginning to unfold in there. Um, let's take South Sudan as an example, a country that is preparing for its own uh, elections. Um, Kenya is a host to uh, uh, so many uh, refugees uh, from South Sudan, maybe close to 300,000. Um, I visited Juba not too long ago, and uh, the president was saying, here we are, a country that uh, has got a refugee crisis. Um, then they are now beginning to receive uh, from the Sudan side uh, almost uh, half a million uh, people who are being displaced. So here's a country that is already in distress, mm. uh, now beginning to take an additional burden. Now, that uh, is, is something that can confine us to perpetual poverty um, in the region. So we really need to get together. Uh, and this is why I, I gave the example that our president um, uh, is, is uh, going to have this session, because he's the chair of the quartet under the IGAD arrangement, uh, the heads of state, to try and pursue uh, this and it is our desire that uh, we unify all efforts uh, because there was the Jeddah process, there's another process being driven by Egypt, uh, there's the IGAD uh, process itself. Mm -hmm. uh, now, all these are targeted at intervening in this crisis. Um, why don't we get together? and have a unified uh, approach mm. uh, so that uh, we can stem the, the challenges that are there. Mm. Yeah. So that sense of unified approach might take us on to climate change, which you talked about as, as the new kid on the block, yeah. or the envir environmental yeah, questions. Yeah, I mean, they've been with us forever, but the, the, the sense of crisis and urgency on climate change um, more recently. And every country is grappling with energy transition and uh, use of natural resources and the costs of this. How is that shaping up for Kenya? What are you going to do as a government about the costs of this? Now, first of all, it's important for us to note that in Kenya, um, our grid is largely green. We are at 93% uh, green energy. Wind, solar, geothermal. Um, so we, uh, we, we are not just... Uh, uh, talking, as it were. We're actually walking the talk, uh, if I may use that terminology. Mm -hmm. now, <laughs> yeah, so, so it would be uh, important that um, this is taken seriously because um, ultimately uh, our growth, our sustainability is dependent on policies, programs, and uh, refiring of our efforts using the green uh, energy. We would like to have uh, a new financial order. Uh, when you talk of the core, COP uh, resolutions, for instance, there's a conversation about the loss and damage mm -hmm. uh, uh, fund. Um, and we are happy that commitments now have been made. Uh, to the tune of about, uh, I think, 100 billion uh, or thereabouts. Hope we can get more. 
Now, we want those commitments to, I mean, we want those figures to translate from pledges to actual uh, commitments so that the countries uh, that can benefit from the resources can do so. But we must also remember that the loss and damage fund or initiative cannot replace the debt uh, of Aha on many, uh, many, many countries. Um, it is, it, this would be a targeted intervention. The loss and damage can be regarded as a targeted intervention. But the long-term agenda must be how can we get uh, the debt overhung, uh, loosened on, on uh, many of the economies so that resources can then go into the areas that can uh, have a serious impact on alleviation of poverty um, for, for the millions of, of people uh, all, over, all over the globe. So I, I, uh, I, I want to say that um, from the perspective of where we sit, uh, we just have to be more aggressive. We have to create a more balanced approach. Um, for instance, as I, I can give another example where we are trying to push for uh, the carbon taxes, mm -hmm. um, so, so that we can, we can bring some balance uh, globally. Uh, if indeed uh, what we are beginning to experience all over in terms of completely unprecedented uh, climatic shifts, um, then there's a crisis. For instance, in Kenya, we had just emerged from the worst drought in 40 years. Then this year, we've been hit by the El Nino. Roads <laughs> are being washed away now. Uh, and a lot of water is going to waste. So we really have to figure out how do we uh, prepare better. Uh, and this requires resources, requires concerted efforts. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why this agenda is, mm -hmm. is absolutely uh, critical. Okay. I'm going to come to people's questions in just a, a second, because I think there will be a lot. And there's a lot of very good ones online. But you're mentioning debt. And we at Chatham House put out a big report on uh, debt and debt relief in Africa last year. And I was curious what role you wanted China to play in this, because getting China on board with, um, with some treatment of the debt, uh, many people, including those at Chatham House, might argue is, is essential. China is a big economy. Uh, yes. And, and uh, through the, the um, Road and Belt Initiative and other programs, uh, they have been involved in uh, uh, supporting many uh, countries on matters of infrastructure. Uh, uh, and therefore, if uh, in the process of contributing to um, bringing some measure of balance in the global economy, uh, I think if they can consider uh, aspects of uh, uh, restructuring their, their, their debt uh, with some of the countries. That would be a very significant contribution. Mm -hmm. um, just as much as uh, we would be saying the same for some of the Western uh, uh, economies, that the issue of restructuring and reconsidering uh, how to, to, to support these nations is important. Mm -hmm. um, the challenges we've been facing have caused us uh, serious supply chains uh, globally uh, for essential issues, fertilizer, uh, basic uh, food, sometimes medicines uh, that, are, uh, that are required. When the financial markets adjust or interest rates are adjusted the way they were adjusted, mm -hmm. this completely uh, alters the debt profile mm -hmm. of, of many countries. And therefore, the bigger economies uh, need to think seriously on how to, to intervene, and they can do so. Um, we have seen some countries, I don't want to, debt is a very delicate issue. Uh, I may not want to quote some specific countries at this stage, but 
I think what is important is that we are seeing for some there's there's some measure of of of, uh, of, of uh, understanding uh, uh, that is is happening, uh, and that's that's useful. Yeah. Kenya, for instance, many years ago, we had to go through uh, our own debt uh, rescheduling. Uh, I happened to be minister for finance then, and uh, I know that. It's, it's not a pleasant exercise when you have to go to the whole process of rescheduling and mm. reorganizing a debt portfolio mm. so that you can find ways of releasing critical resources where, it's, where they're needed most. Mm. So, but, but the situation you're facing is of, is of a massive scale. Mm. Uh, and therefore, the big economies, <coughs> China and the Western countries, uh, have an important role to play. Let me ask you just finally then, you mentioned King Charles, new head of the Commonwealth. Do you think the Commonwealth needs reform to have a useful future? Uh, I think the Commonwealth is a, a strong voice. It's a, maybe a collegiate of, of several nations. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that uh, we have not exercised uh, our collective strength uh, appropriately for quite some time. So there's an opportunity uh, for the Commonwealth to become more vocal uh, in critical areas, some of which is exactly the debt mm -hmm. uh, agenda, uh, the whole issue of restructuring the financial architecture for, for in, in the international scene so that we can have more accessibility for nations in more favorable terms, uh, that would be uh, important. So the, the Commonwealth uh, can play a role, and it should play a role, and this is an opportunity for them to, uh, to, to just f figure out uh, uh, how can they reignite uh, the, the strength that they, they have. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to questions. Right, there are lots and lots, and there's some good ones online. Right, um, let me just survey how many we've got, and lots. Um, let's, let's come to, I'll take them in pairs, uh, two, two here, first uh, in the pink shirt on the aisle, and then, uh, and then there. Hello, how are you, Excellency? My name is Julius Baluto. I'm a broadcaster here in the UK. Um, I want to ask a question about, we are living in a world that's divided, United Nations Security Council, extremely divided between the BRICS nations, China, Russia, Brazil, and the other side, Western Hemisphere. We have seen that illustrated by the war in Ukraine. We have seen that being illustrated in Gaza right now as we speak. My point, uh, the international community we call extremely busy with all this going on. What about when we come back to Africa, Your Excellency? That sleeping giant you are calling Africa, what can we do to wake it up, to seek self-oriented solutions to African problems, to have an international system or Africa, for example, currency, to make sure we are attracting investment, to make sure we are self-reliant? What can we do in Kenya to make sure we are self-reliant? What methods can we use to make sure Kenya is not also a sleeping giant. Africa stops being a sleeping giant because the world is too busy. Excuse me, sir. It doesn't have a, any time for us. Beautifully put as um, a mini speech within a question. Uh, actually, let's, let's, let, let, let's, let's take that one, and I'll take a few one by one because uh, they have some complexity to them. Kenya, how not to be a sleeping giant. Africa, how not to be a sleeping giant. Yes, I, I gave the example in my remarks about the Africa continental free area, uh, trade area. and. These are, these are 55 countries. Let me tell you that um, virtually all the countries have signed up. Uh, they've submitted the instruments to be part of uh, the Africa Free Continental uh, Trade Area. Now, that is a good signal. It's a good sign. Um, and through there, we can work together and enhance the connectivity and trade uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, I've given an example again in my remarks about 
uh, Kenya uh, providing a visa-free regime for the African countries. Now, these are issues that we can do ourselves as Africa without having to look beyond the African borders to start getting our own people uh, integrating and moving much more freely. Uh, we have institutions uh, such as uh, the African Development Bank, uh, which, which can be strengthened, uh, AfriExim, the trading blocks as well, such as the East African Community and the SADAC, COMESA. All these can be consolidated, and we can do it ourselves um, so that we prepare our capacity to be able to, to trade and, and uh, uh, share our economic uh, resources. We can unlock a lot of the mining potential uh, that, that we have. But the biggest challenge is for us as Africans to deal with the peace issues. Because then we, we must stop being our own enemies. We must stop undermining our own cause. Uh, and that is why the initiatives to try and deal with the crisis in Sudan and the other areas in the region is that critical step that we must take ourselves, have our solutions to unlock our potential. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to come back to Sudan. Uh, there's one here in the second row. Hi, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for the conversation. Um, I want. Uh, me, would you like to say who you are? Oh, yes. Um, I'm Kylan Gao from the LIC, uh, London School of Economics. And my question is uh, on the more technical side, uh, with increasing interregional uh, trade, there comes a lot of structural changes to. Uh, to the economy, would you, how would the, um, your government anticipate some of the challenges of perhaps uh, out, uh, jobs outsourcing to other countries due to those regional changes? And what are the solutions? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think we must be ready to also be liberal. Um, one of the, the, the challenges within the African uh, continent is that, um, I mean, let me speak about Kenya specifically. We have a lot of young people who have been trained. Uh, for your information, the median age in Africa is literally 20. It's actually 19 years point something. So we are talking of a very young uh, uh, demography. And we would like to be able to allow these talented people to move freely. Um, we are working, for instance, on having more and more Kenyans uh, coming to work here in the UK and in other areas in specific fields, uh, medical field. Uh, we are now talking of the diaspora, uh, the Kenyan diaspora, and um, uh, it has actually overtaken um, the remittances <coughs> of the Kenyan diaspora has actually overtaken our principal exports in terms of what uh, they're able to remit uh, back to the, to, to the country. And these are people who are engaging and going out to uh, work elsewhere. So we, in, in the whole issue, we should not try and confine labor in some limited space. We must also provide the environment that allows free movement of labor, and hence the issue that I'm talking about, opening up on the visas, for instance, uh, so that people can move, and, and that's how we, we, we have the economies growing. I don't know whether I've dealt with the, your Good. issue. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. I'm going to stir in one from online, which is relevant to that, from Agnes Kigotho. And she says, as a Kenyan and a, a, a Common Futures Conversation member, I should say the Common Futures Conversation is something Chatham House runs between young people in uh, Europe and Africa, every year, uh, hundreds of them, a uh, conversation about international relations brokered by Chatham House. And she says, look, I'm c concerned about the, the cost of living, despite all the, res the support, where is the money going? Because as a young person, 
many companies are shutting down due to high, heavy taxes and bullying from cartels. What is the Kenyan government doing to retain and attract, attract investors as corruption is a big malady eating our country? Yeah, um, I would say that um, the, I must admit the cost of living is a big challenge in Kenya at the moment uh, and indeed in many other countries. Um, and what are the broad factors? The broad factors are some of those that we have touched on uh, as, as, as we speak here, uh, supply chains that have been disrupted uh, because of uh, turmoil in other areas. So to a certain extent, they are the global issues. Uh, but we also have to come to uh, uh, the local scene. And in Kenya, for instance, uh, we are struggling to live within our means. We have to enhance and broaden revenue collection in Kenya. Right now, we have an IMF program running, uh, and also uh, the World Bank. These are critical partners uh, when it comes to the need to stabilize uh, economies. And in certain instances, um, it calls for s some austerity measures. Kenya went on a borrowing spree uh, previously. Um, we are trying to make sure that we can live up to being able to honor our obligations. Where does the government get money? Government must get money from uh, the taxes. That is where you get your principal source of money. So we are going to have some difficult time. And I did say uh, in our parliament, uh, I told them that um, looking at where we were coming from as Kenya, uh, we would have a fairly difficult three years or so uh, for us to be able to stabilize. And then we can start seeing uh, better prospects. The other side of it is that um, I would like uh, uh, Madame Kigoto to also consider what would be the consequences if Kenya was moving without an IMF partnership and a World Bank partnership. What would be the consequences? If we think that this is bad, can we try and imagine what it would look like without an engagement with the international partners. So there are some hard decisions to be made, uh, and Kenya is making those uh, uh, decisions. Um, but we must fight corruption. We have to fight corruption. Uh, and uh, we need to get our institutions working better. Uh, we need to see. Um, uh, the lead time between identifying the problem, the investigation process, and uh, the legal processes that go with it um, being tackled faster. And I'll give an example. Um, I, we were in uh, the COP28 uh, as, as, as Kenya, and one of the things we executed as a memorandum of understanding was uh, an MOU with the United Arab Emirates to share intelligence and details where necessary on matters of either that would be related to money laundering or any other illicit transactions. Now, this is important because for quite some time, part of the story in Kenya was that uh, the United Arab Emirates had become a heaven for uh, uh, people who are engaged in uh, illegal activities in, in Kenya. So but for us going out there to have instruments of mutual assistance agreed upon and agreeing to even extradite uh, 
criminal elements between the two countries, I think becomes one of the signals we are sending uh, that we want to deal with corruption. Over and above that, our parliament has moved on the bill where there's, so that if there's a conflict of interest, uh, that can be uh, exposed. If you are in government and you're doing business, that was not there. Uh, we have enhanced the issue of money, the, uh, strengthen the money launder, anti money laundering act uh, in in in, uh, in Kenya. Um, we have, for instance, gone to the level where now even lawyers, after a ping pong, lawyers have now agreed to be part of those that can disclose. Uh, if they have clients that seem to be engaging in uh, uh, illicit activities. This was not there before. So systematically we are looking at that and uh, we, we have, as Kenya, subjected ourselves to the peer review uh, on aspects of uh, uh, looking at uh, aspects of uh, financial uh, 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 action group where where we, we can evaluate and see whether systems that you have running in your financial systems and so forth are those that can prevent corruption and resources that are related to, to terrorism and so forth. So, so those steps are being made not just from a verbal perspective but actually being anchored by new legislation. So these are some of the issues that will be uh, uh, that will definitely pay a dividend, in my view, uh, going forward because it's beginning to put to make it very clear that the room for corruption is becoming narrower by the day. Thank you. Right, even more hands up. I'm I'm really sorry. I'm going to pick one, which is right in the back there. And I'm really sorry, every, everyone, so to, to, to have that one. And a brief question, if, if that's thank, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, Lawrence Muli from Address Group. Thank you so much, uh, Waziri, for, for your great speech. Uh, quick question on uh, peace and security, uh, uh, you know, um, work that you mentioned. Um, firstly, uh, we, to a normal taxpayer in Kenya, for example, what, what would be the return investment, for example, on us going to Haiti, number one, and then what's the broader role of partnering with the African Union and other organizations that they concerted efforts together in such interventions? Thank you very much indeed. I, th I think uh, the Haiti action is, remember we are a member of the United Nations. And I think uh, some, uh, when we provide a lead role, of course we'll not be alone, uh, we are looking forward to uh, other nations, and I know, for instance, Jamaica has committed to um, to provide 300 uh, uh, security personnel to be part of the team. Quite a number of African countries uh, are also declaring their interest uh, to be able to support us. Algeria, for instance, uh, uh, actually put, they have written to us committing that they are going to make uh, a monetary contribution uh, to this and they have given us the figure uh, as a nation so that this initiative uh, can be successful. And ultimately, uh, we hope that uh, the multi-national uh, teams that will be together could put together about 5,000 uh, police personnel or security personnel to assist in the Haiti affair. So the 1,000 from Kenya is the lead, but it is not a solo uh, initiative of, of the people of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, Kenya. And we have played our role quite effectively in the past. We have been in the peacekeeping efforts in Namibia, in the West African region. Uh, we had uh, teams in uh, 
in Kosovo, we've had people in East Timor. Now, this is a profile that is absolutely important. And uh, looking at our statement about the need to profile Kenya uh, as, as uh, uh, a willing partner to contribute to the peace process globally, uh, I think this is an initiative that needs to be supported. And by and large, on the local scene, uh, it has gone through parliament. Our parliament has lent support to this initiative. So it is something where we are carrying the people with it. Thank you for that. Uh, there's still a forest of hands up, and I'm trying to, uh, trying to beam at you instead of being able to give you time. I, I can see from who it uh, is and the, and the urgency of this that they would be great questions, but we don't have any more time. Online, um, terrific questions as well. Patrick Maluki, I hope we answered part of your, your question about debt. Eliud uh, Kibil. Um, uh, uh, also the same about the uh, Haiti. Um, uh, Salah, Salah, I'm sorry for your beautifully succinct question. What is Kenya's vision on ending the war in Sudan? We could take a whole afternoon on that and, and can't come on to it. And Eric uh, Muhi in Strathclyde, um, a special uh, uh, bonus uh, prize for asking how does Scotland fit in to Kenya's yeah. strategic <laughs> vision, uh, which I, I was tempted by, but we just can't get in. Can we... Um, uh, they, 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 uh, on, they, on a lighter note, the, yeah. the, it fits in very well. The, I, I bumped into the first minister of Scotland, yeah. and he told me that he has origins in Mombasa. Right. There you go. I, we actually got a question and an answer, answer to that question. Well, I'm going to have to leave you and the High Commissioner and your colleagues to what I gather is a giant party, as I put it, for the 60th anniversary of independence tomorrow. But could you all join me in thanking His Excellency? <laughs>